from Herodotus and try to squeeze whatever we can from it. And I was naive because I could squeeze so much more from that particular passage than what I've actually uh, got to present to you. But in any case, um, we're going to talk about Cyrene. And Cyrene, if we're going to look at the general map of Greek colonization, this is taken from my small Greek world. Cyrene was founded in Libya around 631 BC. Exceptionally, its founder was also a king, uh, Batos I, the ancestor of the dynasty. In the mid sixth century BC, about three generations since its foundation, there was a stasis in Cyrene. It involved dynastic issues combined with military defeats, as well as severe social and political tensions. Following an inquiry at Delphi, a supreme arbitrator arrived from abroad and made things right. A comprehensive idea of what is meant to belong to the police in the sixth century emerges out of his reform. Okay, so this is the general area of Cyrene. Note the Cyrene independencies like Apollonia and Taukera, not all of them dependencies. And this is the passage, the first part of the passage we're going to look at. Now, Archesilaus is king. I'm using Godley's translation on purpose, not a good one, but there are reasons for the discrepancies, which I like to point out. Archesilaus' kinship passed on to his son Batos, who was lame and infirm on his feet. The Cyrenians, in view of the affliction that had overtaken them, sent to Delphi to ask what political arrangement would enable them to live best. Well, the word political arrangement don't appear in the text. Uh, the priestess told them to bring a mediator, a catartistero, from Mantinea in Arcadia. When the Cyrenians sent a request, the Mantineans gave them the most valued citizen, eh, Dokimotaton, whose name was Demonax. When this man came to Cyrene and learned everything, he divided the people into three tribes, the Philosophoiese, of which the Therians and the Perioikoi were one, Mian Moirane Poiese, the Peloponnesians, Cretans the second, Alende, and all the islanders, the third, Cretans. Furthermore, he set apart certain domains and priesthoods for their king Batos, but all the rest, which had belonged to the kings, were now to be held by the people in common. I'll come back to this uh, expression of esmeson, uh, todemo efeke. Okay? So I shall concentrate on just a few points that relate to the comprehensive vision of the polis and the citizens share in it. The source of the authority of Demonax, his peculiar position at Delphi, the purpose and means of his tribal reform, the mixture of the citizen body, and the idea of power to the people and the notion of the middle. Now, following some dynastic issues, perhaps even a regency, it was not a king, note, but the Cyrenians as a political community that made the inquiry at Delphi. It was an open ended inquiry seeking Apolline knowledge, not an approval. Uh, or the course of action. It was not a question suitable for a yes, no answer as we find with most lot oracles. The inquiry reveals the problem, how best to arrange order, kathistemi themselves. Although Herodotus paints the stasis in dynastic terms from the reforms of Demonax, it seemed clear that the issues were political, resulting in the diminishing the rights of the king, giving power to the demos, and refounding the social and political order by a mixture of the population in the newly reformed Cyrenian tribe. Do you hear me well now? Is that all right? Beautifully. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Those probably incorporated the immigrants who came in various waves and thus reunited, reunified the territory by acknowledging the equal status of land holdings in relation to its citizen status. By his tribal reform, Demonax clearly reshuffled the deck of the citizenry. The details are debated, but all would agree that reform were basically comprehensive. It was tantamount to a refoundation of the social and political order of the place. Now, he was a specialist. First, he learned Mathain, and then he acted. Not like all politicians, by the way. Demonax clearly divided the citizen body into three tribes, probably conforming to the number of three Dorian tribes that had existed at Sarini previously. Note that the translation we read glosses over the word Moira, which is a term that appears in inscriptions from the fourth century in Cyrene, 
Moirai and Etairai denoting subgroups of citizens. However, we cannot be sure if those existed in that sense two, year, two centuries before that. So Herodotus may be saying something quite simple. He divided and distributed the people over and into three tribes. The third part, literally Moira, was composed of Therians and Perioikos. A second third, namely another Moira of Peloponnesian and Cretans. And the third Moira was the tribe of the islanders. Now this may be supported by the preceding verb of action, diatitheme, to play separately, arrange each in their own places. As often with verbs preceded by dia, like dianeme, they imply distribution over various units, something like kinter, but not the same as tribuo and tribus in Latin to assign, to allot. So what Demonax did was to distribute the Cyrenians among those tribes. Note that Herodotus does not give us the actual names of the tribes. He uh, describes them, the result of what Demonax learned and then addressed them. It was clearly something to do with tensions among settlers of various origins uh, who flooded into rich Cyrene ever since Apollo had addressed the oracle to all the Greeks, Ace Helenas Pantas, promising Cleroi to new citizens. The Pythian priestess warned all the Greeks by an oracle excuse me, I have to, move this, to cross the sea and to live in Libya with the Cyrenians, for the Cyrenians invited them, promising a distribution of land, guess anadasmos. And this was the oracle, now Herodotus quotes it. Whoever goes to beloved Libya after the division of the land, guess anadasmos, I say, Apollo speaking, shall be very sorry afterwards. So a great multitude goes on Herodotus, gathered at Cyrene and cut out great tracts of land from the territory of the neighboring Libyans. Gesanadasmos is also a colonial term, denoting land reserved for future parcellation and distribution, aside from the original protoi kleroi, the first lots that had been distributed by lot to Greek colonists. By the time of the reform, the Therians had obviously become a minority among the Helenoi Pantoi who flocked to rich Libya. Herodotus places the immigration oracle not before two generations had passed uh, since the foundation of uh, Cyrene in 631 BC, giving the impression that not much was happening in between. <clears throat> However, archaeology tells us a little different story. Um, within the last third of the seventh century, namely in those 30 years when Cyrene was founded, uh, not only Cyrene, but also Apollonia, you see it on the map, the port, and Taucheira, modern Tokra, were settled. Now we are told that an Olympic victor from Sparta, Chionis, probably came as a co-founder with Bacchus, perhaps conforming to the nomos which Thucydides mentions, that when a colony founds yet another colony, it invites a co-founder from its original mother city. I take this seriously, especially since Thucydides brings several examples of this nomos. The existence of low-grade Laconian pottery, I emphasize low-grade Laconian pottery at Taucheira, may be linked with Sparta or Lacedaemon, and suggests an explanation for the elements of Peloponnesians in the tribal reform. The chain Sparta Thera Cyrene is significant. It plays a major part in, uh, this is a map I drew for the book I wrote called Myth and Territory in Sparta and Mediterranean. This is the one on the right, which is translated into French. And uh, La Mediterranean Spartiate or the Sparta Mediterranean, here you have marked all the places in the Mediterranean that either considered themselves Spartan colonies or were actually Spartan colonies. And the book also talks about Sparta as a Mediterranean entity, in addition to discussing myths and territories and the legitimation of conquest and settlements. So Greeks believed that Sparta was the mother city of Thera. Thera was the metropolis of Cyrene, and Chionis came from Sparta. Thera itself had been settled by Dorians, apparently not before the first half of the eighth century, so the tradition has a chance of being historical. These are not the Ionian migrations. In any case, Greeks in the archaic period acted as if this had been a historical fact. 
And so for our purpose, and our period, it is actually a shared mental fact. In Pindar's fourth Scythian, Medea prophesied that should the Argonauts bring the cloud of earth they had been given at Lake Triponis in Libya safely to Lake Damon, then in the fourth generation after the Argonaut Euphemos, colonists would set out to Libya from Lake Damon. However, since the cloud of earth, a pars pro toto, representing all of Libya, was washed onto the shores of Terra during the storm only in the 16th generation, another descendant of that very same Euphemos, namely Batos I, will set out not from Sparta, but from Thera and established Cyrene, his genealogy is given by Herodotus. Lucia Ceket thinks the tripartite division into those tribes reflects different ways of settlers coming at different stages. He thinks he can identify them in the literary evidence. That seems reasonable, reasonable, although I find it difficult to identify such distinct ways for the simple reason that everybody started coming right from the start. Now, somehow the rearrangement of citizens and tribes must have been connected to land, but we have no idea how. Perhaps the promise of the Delphic Oracle was not carried out in terms of equality implied. What seems clear is that the new citizen body of Cyrene, explicitly defined as a demos, was the result of an reintegration of various groups of settlers into the now empowered political community of Cyrene while allotting subgroups with their cleroi on which they live to their three philae. No one knows who were those perioikoi. Lily and Jeffrey proposed they had been the perioikoi status already at Thera. However, both Herodotus and the Cyrene Foundation decree insist on the comprehensive nature, on the comprehensive nature of uh, the foundation, not according to various statuses in Thera itself. One son from each household from all the seven regions of Thera says Herodotus. And we'll come back to the foundation decree later. In my view, the uh, Perioikoi were simply early Greek colonists who got lands beyond the initial kernel of settlers, but this is a case of plausibility. We may think of Turioi as a parallel where tensions broke out between the original Sybarite colonists and the newcomers were allocated worse, more distant lands. This is Diodorus speaking about the Sybarites who were assigning all the important offices to themselves. And furthermore, the lands lying near the city, the Sybarites were portioning out an allotment among themselves and the more distant land to the newcomers, end quote. This is not end well, this, these are my words. The new settlers massacred the former ones and then quote, since the countryside was extensive and rich, they sent for colonists in large numbers from Greece and to these they assigned parts of the city and gave them equal shares of the land. Then Choran epi Isis So the foundation decree of Cyrene, quoted in the fourth century inscription, projects a need for further distribution by lot of lands for later arrivals from the metropolis. Apollon Hanen is the verb used. Curiously, the terminology corresponds to the foundation story of Terra itself <clears throat> in Herodotus. Once the Minii, the descendants of the Argonauts, arrived from Lemnos of Sparta, they demanded full integration. They said that having been expelled from Lemnos, those Minii. Right? Sorry? Sorry? Uh, uh, they had come to the land of their fathers, as was most just, and their wish was to live with their father's people, sharing in their rights, and receiving a lot of pieces of land. The same expression in Cyrene. The Lacedaemonians were happy to receive the Minii, so they received the Minii and gave them land and distributed them among their own tribes. Okay, and it's referring to the demands earlier. The demands are explicit, and their wish was to live with their father's people, sharing in their rights and receiving allotted portions of land. Okay, 
So let us remember that this guy, Euphemos, carrying the cloud of earth that gave rights of settlement to Libya, he too was a minion, as emphasized by both Pindar and Herodotus. The argonaut Euphemos, so you see, we're creating a Cyrenian mindset here in which this reform was operating. The Argonaut Euphemus is the link in the chain, Sparta Thera Cyrene. The story emphasizes the integrated overlap of sharing in the polis, literally of portions of Moirai and honors of Timai, and receiving allotted portions of land, all in the framework of the vocabulary of the lot. I should uh, say that I'm hopefully about to finish a book on the uses of the lot in Greek lotteries throughout archaic history. The last chapter is written by my colleague, uh, Josine Bloch on the Athenian democracy. The first time I think such a book is written and as we touch something new, suddenly everything revolves around the lot. So in terms of Greek notions of citizenship, often expressed as met echen tes poleos, here we have this concrete expression, sharing in klevos. That had been the case with most of the new foundations in the archaic period. Now, similarly, the distinct group of Spartans sent out not to Thera, but to found Taras in southern Italy in the end of the eighth century, 706, were promised that should their colonization fail, they would have the right to return home and receive, says Ephoros, one fifth of Messenia. In other words, social, social and political integration was expressed as having a share in the whole well, land in this case, or state, portion of the whole of the territory overlapped with the members of the community, all sharers in the state. It's no wonder that in Greek, certainly in Homeric Greek, the word demos means both land, territory, and people. The owner of the demos was the demos, says Walter Donlin. What Demonax did, so it seems, was a reinstatement of that inclusiveness. The Minions were supposedly spread over the Spartan tribes. They did not constitute a new one. Even though a recent inscription discussed by Brunione about uh, a tribe of fugitive from Zankle may have been added to Himera at some point uh, as a separate tribe. The tribes at Serini are not ethnically labeled. The names are geographical. Moreover, as Denis Roussel observes, if the purpose was mixture and cohesiveness and to give political power to a single demos, which is the explicit purpose of the end, why then insist on separation along lines of origin? That's a reaction to some such views that do exist, but Karl Joachim Hölkeskamp argues convincingly that the number three, as I said, had been traditional drawing division of Thera before Demonax. And what he did was a distribute, redistribute the Cyrenian citizens evenly over the tripartite division and the subdivision. In that Demonax and Pleistinus, the Athenian, were similar in terms of purpose, namely mixture and cohesiveness of the citizen body. It was already Aristotle who compared Demonax Placedness. A democracy of this kind could also find useful such institutions as were employed by Cleisthenes at Athens when he wished to increase the power of the democracy and by the party setting up the democracy at Cyrene. Different tribes and brotherhoods must be created outnumbering the old ones and every device must be employed to make all the people as much as possible intermingled with one another and to break up the previously existing groups of associates. So let's say a few words about the lot here. Clayston has used the lot on a grand scale. <clears throat> Was Demonox a predecessor? Did he distribute the Cyrenians into the new tribes by lot? Actually, if not, how did he do it? Less than half a century later, Clayston has indeed employed the lot to reshuffle the entire Athenian deck. Clayston has first uh, divided the whole body into 10 tribes instead of the existing four, wishing to mix them up. It's likely that Demonax did the same, especially in view of the role of lotteries in homogenizing and mixing the citizen population, which seems to have been one of the goals of the reform. There were wide ranging uses for the lot among archaic Greeks. The 
which was used to uh, distribute, distribute booty, distribute the portion of sacrificial meat, distribute partible inheritance by lot, distribute clero in colonies. There were procedural lotteries, not distribution lotteries. Procedural lotteries determine order and terms as the chariot race, the guard shifts, who's going to be the president of the Bulli for the next 24 hours in the fourth century and so on. Uh, selective lotteries chose persons for specific tasks or mixture lotteries were designed to make society more cohesive. I'll give an example of that. I'll say it. The lottery is an excellent means for equalization, mostly providing equal chances in distribution to all participants. Equal and fair terms for division and distribution appear as a major function of the lottery. As, and they are thus specified in the Serenian Foundation Decree. They are to sail an equal and fair, or equal and like. I discussed that in the book. According to households, one son to be chosen from the top of each family of those who are under prime of life. Herodotus put it, taking one of every pair of brothers. We note that when the Theorans set out to settle in Libya, they chose the colonists by lot. This is Athera, yeah? one brother from each household. Not only the inscription, but Herodotus stresses that as well. But the Theorian lottery at home achieved something else. It provided a metaphorical as well as a concrete mixture of the home community, which had been undergoing great difficulties at Thera. In some sense, well, in some sense, it was a refoundation of the mother city, redefining itself through its first attested collective act as a community. Uh, I sent a list of references uh, in case you'd like to see uh, uh, some support for that. It also implies the basic equivalence of all theorems, equivalence of all theorems. Any brother would do. One can stay home, the other would depart, but who? Lottery inside a family. And that is no small matter. It's already in Homer we hear of lottery among several brothers to choose the one to go to Troy. He has six sons beside, says Hermes disguised, and I'm the seventh, and I shook lots, the word is Palo, with the others, and it was my lot, Kleros, to come on this venture. Now, in partable inheritance by lot, too, there was no primogeniture. It's a very Greek thing, interesting. Any brother was equivalent to any other. This says something about the perception of persons as individuals. They are interchangeable, hence their equivalent. Each person is as valid as any other, a precondition for the formation of an egalitarian mindset and eventually of isonomia. The action of the lottery implies that the community was perceived as a whole entity with the lottery expressing a fair mixture of society. Thus, while the equal and fair terms relate to what colonists would get by lot once they will have arrived and settled in Libya, namely equal pleroi, the lottery at home expresses the unity of the community by its comprehensive mix of households. It also reveals a mindset which I suggest supports the notion that Demonax had indeed employed the lot in Serena. <clears throat> the use of the lots in societies is what Mark Granovetter proposes to call weak ties. He proposes a network theory, which I've used in my small Greek world, of the strength of weak ties. Our acquaintances, namely the weak ties, are less likely to be socially involved with one another than our close family friends or three or four very close friends that we have. These are strong ties. Such acquaintances will also have a group of friends, one of whom may be, may know precisely a, a dentist you might need. But if your very close friends ask each other and nobody knows, then they will never know. So this is basically the core theory of Granovetter here. Yeah, the weak tie exists in a low density network, as he calls it, and becomes therefore a crucial link between the densely knit clumps of close kin or friends. It also follows that social systems with just strong ties and lacking weak ones would be fragmented and incoherent. New ideas will spread slowly 
and scientific endeavors will be handicapped. In other words, the strength of weak ties may explain how large networks that extend beyond the realm of strong fragmenting ties of family or local interest can have all encompassing strong and dynamic connectivity in society. And the lottery of mixture does precisely that. A mixture of the society by lot could sometimes be enforced <clears throat> as a means for reconciling civic tension. Now, Aristotle tells us that at Heraia, the lottery replaced elections precisely to avoid a civil strife. Another source, Aeneas the Tactician, tells the story of Heraclea Pontica in the Black Sea, where under the democracy, the rich conspired against the people. So it was decided to divide the population into 60 units, 60 units within each the rich would be a minority. We are not told how the division was made, but the use of the lot is highly probable. It is explicit in an elaborate lottery, that I cannot discuss it here, uh, that resolved the civil strife at Nakone in Sicily. 60 pairs of opposing brothers, there were two camps, right? It took one brother from each. 60 pairs were chosen by lot. To each pair, three more persons were added by lot from the entire community, so you could never know what's going to be the majority in each pentad. And now the 60 pentads all form, uh, they combine and they have a mixture and it, the whole inscription ends with a lovely uh, cult to harmony. Uh, in short, lotteries combined with mixture afford a restart of society, which is precisely the purpose of the reforms of Demonax and of Claestonus, where the lottery, of course, is explicit. Civil strife in Greek cities often followed groupings that threatened to break up the police, whereas reconciliation aimed to uh, reverse such situations by restoring the primacy of the weak ties and reintroducing social and political mixture by law. Civil strife was especially acrimonious in small states. The smaller the state, the worse it was, as Aristotle notes since there was no middle to cushion and mitigate issues. So let's say a few words about the middle. The climax of the passage we have just seen uh, is the transfer of power to the people. Then monarchs leaves the king with the religious functions and all the rest that the kings used to control, he transferred towards the middle of Meson to the demo. Okay, now translators have a problem. I just brought three examples because how do you translate this middle? Let us note some, David Green, but all the rest of the original possessions of the king he assigned as public property. Les grands, et mis en commun pour le peuple, tout le reste de ce que possédait précédemment le roi. The Selincourt, and threw open to the people in general all the other privileges which had previously been enjoyed by the king. Well, they have obviously a problem with translating the middle. Now, Herodotus mentions three cases in which a one-man rule is contrasted with popular sovereignty and with the idea that citizens ought to be homo yul, equal, not totally equal, but equal with, with respect to the citizen status. In all three, Herodotus contrasts one-man rule with transferring power to the middle, esmeson, which is what homo yul deserves. Demonax gave power to the middle, to the people. Herodotus repeats the same expression when he speaks about, after the Polycrates, the tyranny of Polycrates at Samos, Mariandrios attempted to return power to the people, or literally to bring it to the middle, esmeson, because people should be homoioi. This is explicit in the text. And then proclaim isonomia, again, explicit. Furthermore, the middle and equality can be considered as expression of what men who are just, have justice, do. Instead of holding on to supreme power at cost, a man named Cadmos, because of his sense of justice, placed power in the middle. And this is what he says, this Cadmos has previously inherited from his father the tyranny of Kos. Although the tyranny was well established, he then nevertheless handed the government over to the whole body of Cohen's of his own free will. This he did under no constraint of danger, but out of a sense of justice 
And he then went to Sicily, where he was given by the Samian, the city of Zanglin, which he colonized, at Oikise, calling Zanglin, and changed its name to Messini. So he didn't get such a bad deal after all. So what is this middle? Converging fields of Greek philosophy and geometry, Jean-Pierre Vernon, and especially Marcel Détienne, articulated in the 1980s as Messon in social and political terms and in relation also to egalitarian aspects. Take some Homeric examples, which I've studied. Booties brought to the middle, Tasmos esto Messon, prize of competition and booty are brought to the middle in the public eye witnessed by the assembly. <laughs> Speakers in the soldiers' assembly speak from the middle. And when Agamemnon abuses this public convention and speaks from where he's sitting, the poet makes special note of that. When Agamemnon finally capitulates and wishes to pay Achilles, the emissary of Agamemnon, Odysseus, suggests bringing the promised gift to the middle of our assembly. This is, in fact, what happens later. Agamemnon has to bring it to the middle. Had he personally given, given the gifts, Achilles would have been indebted to him directly instead of to the public. So setting things in the middle, apparently at the assembly, transforms them, makes them public, exposes to a common gaze. The middle implies the circumference of society. In being middle, it is equidistant from its members. It implies a view of the community from the center radiating outwards. For my book, I prepared this simplistic diagram just to illustrate the constant dialogue between the parameter, only those who have a right to share and who wish uh, to be uh, included, excluding everybody else, but the, the middle also defines them. So we have this back and forth uh, movement, as it were. A collection of early poems attributed to Theognis connects the social order with allotment. The social order with allotment. It employs the metaphor of the ship of state and complains that by brute force, the wicked pillage riches, all order has vanished. Who knows even when booty, actually the text is literally when the sharing out, the dasmos, is still brought to the middle, estomeson, to be shared out equally. So we have all the key terms here concentrated in this uh, quote. In Greek, uh, deliberation on the course of action may be expressed as to set the matter down in the middle. Herodotus too thinks the term isonomia, he, he connects the term isonomia with the middle. In the famous constitutional debate, Otanes, who supports isonomia, quote, was for turning the government over to the Persian people, but the Greek says esmeson persesi. So that is how he also imagines the center in the famous dictum, if ever, everybody will bring all the troubles to the middle, but eventually uh, leave each with his own. The idea is consistent. When Plutarchus wrote the life of Lycurgus, he expressed the redistribution of the land in such terms. He persuaded his fellow citizens to make one parcel of all the territory, but literally it says to bring it to the middle, es meson, and divide it up anew ex alches. Now this ex alches is significant because it's always the implying the, 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 the reshuffle, the clean state that you are recreating with this kind of holistic vision of society and its division yet again. Now we can do that. A supreme arbitrator, of course. We noted the prefix dia, which we noted the dia titemi and dia neme and some others. It's closely linked with reforms and foundations articulating the distributive aspect of belonging to a community, or in later terms, uh, equal portions of law, isonomia, and citizenship. Diodorus tells the story of the monarchs, but in a moralizing way, as if Batos the I, the founder, was an equitable and marvelous and moral and pious in contrast to his awful descendants who became tyrannical. Hence arose the need for demonarchs, whom he calls not a catartister, but a diatetes, thus diatetes, thus connoting the notion of distribution and division. That is also the term used by Herodotus when describing the arbitration between Athens and uh, Mytilene. Sorry, that's not it. 
So the term belongs to the general idea of a ruler as distributor of goods and honors, often by lot. Oikistai, founders of colonies like Badus I, were responsible for equal distribution, allocating sacred precincts and distributing by lot portions of land to the colonists. The Aitetes belongs to the semantic field of distribution of equal portions, a sort of tangible isonomia. In an essay entitled Table Talk, Plutarch complains that ever since luxury has crept in, the custom of equal share for all in the feast, isomoiria, was abandoned. However, he continues in public and traditional rituals, equality is still preserved, quote, even now at sacrifices and public banquets, each guest is still served an equal portion of the meal. Moreover, dinners were called daites, distributions, the guests daitumones, those to whom distribution is made, and servers daitroi, distributors. It is only more significant that the afol explicitly calls Solon as supreme arbitrator of the state, a dialectes for one year. Jointly chose Solon as arbitrator and Archon and trusted the government to him. Now in LSJ, uh, Dialasso stresses the meaning of dialectes or dialecter as reconciler. It is really more of an arbitrator. In the Fenian inheritance laws, an arbitrator would settle what is equal and partible inheritance by lot. And Aeschylus plays on that in the seven against Thebes, calling Ares a cruel dialectaire. The term used by Herodotus is closer to, to the notion of setting things right, katharpister, similar to the term euphunter used by Theognis. Euphunter is a corrector in a large sense, euphunter to make something straight. So what is a supreme arbitrator who can bring things to the middle? A fascinating feature of Greek political culture. I'm generalizing here, but I think as historians sometimes have to do that. So a fascinating feature of Greek political culture during the archaic period is that of the occasional supreme trusted arbitrator of society. When things are at a stalemate or simply awful, the entire state is handed over to one person who will set things right, which is the meaning of katartistir and katartitsa. Herodotus uses the same term when he discusses stasis and naxos, resolved by uh, the action of uh, the Milesians. Uh, the Parians, he says, chosen out of all the Greeks by the Milesians for this purpose, made peace among them, but, uh, and he uses the word, katartitsa. Uh, Setting matters right does not refer to a single issue, but to a comprehensive reform here, a reshuffle of the social and political deck. The supreme arbitrator is there for a fixed term only, and surprisingly, he goes away, like an early Roman dictator, or like Demonax here, who apparently returned to Mantinea, <clears throat> or like the tradition about Solon, who probably found it was a good idea to take a trip abroad. Pitakos had been Isimnetus for a fixed term of 10 years. Solon was the Alectes for one. Demonax went back, and who knows what actually really happened to Pleistinus in Athens. The ancient Spartans believed in a primordial lawgiver, Lycurgus, who was definitely not of the two royal households, and there's no tradition that he had ever held power himself. According to one tradition, the supreme arbitrator of Spartan society, his ashes were spread at sea because Lycurgus did not want the Spartans to change his constitution on the pretext he had returned to Sparta, if only to be buried there. A similar tradition exists about Phalanthus, the, the Spartan founder of uh, Taras. They also believed, as attested by Tirtaeus in the mid seventh century, that a comprehensive reform in the Spartan Polypeia was handed down by Apollo at Pitho at Delphi. In fact, what is common to all those figures, beside taking early retirement, is that they turned to Delphi for sanction or active involvement, as when the Pythia uh, chose Peliponus Archigetai out of a list of 100 submitted by Cleisthenes that evening. <clears throat> 
Now, I, among my fields, recolonization is a major one, of course, and I often bemoan the fact that it's studied under a category of its own, a heading of its own. But we need to recognize, first of all, that sometimes they are the same people. One brother stays home, the other guy goes to get a kleos in a colony. But we need to recognize a common Greek mindset expressed both at the mother city and at the colony of recognizing the need for supreme arbitrators of society who work in conjunction with the most political of the Greek gods, Apollo. What is the difference, after all, between a reformer such as Pleistenes, who is basically a refounder of the Athenian state, a founder of a new social and political order, and Oikistes, a founder of a colony who does the same thing, except for it being ex novo. There are differences, I'll mark at the end. But let us think of it from the other end of the temporal spectrum, not a time foundation, but much later. Revolutionaries in fourth century Sparta called for ges anadasmos, in the sense of redistribution of lands, facing dwindling numbers of full citizens and having lands concentrated in fewer and fewer hands. It was a call for a restart back to the primordial equality of the 9,000 equal kleroi Lycurgus had distributed to the original Spartan homoioi. Similarly, and directly relevant to Cyrene, the ousted king Archesilaos, that's in the next chapter in Herodotus, tried to get himself an army at Samos, quoting Herodotus now, collecting all the men that he could and promising them a new division of the land, guess another small. But Gesanadasmos had been around, as I said, as a colonial term, signifying land distribution for uh, later immigrants. It was land held in reserve apart from the Lycurgus style comprehensive distribution by law to all the settlers. It was a pan Mediterranean intensive historical phenomenon. I'm bringing up the map of recolonization just to visualize the phenomen phenomenon. Now, if you consider that colonies constituted close to 40% of all the 1,035 Greek city states existing around 500 BCE, according to the uh, Copenhagen Center. If you consider, that's 40%, it's quite a lot. If you consider that they came into being within about less than two centuries, if you consider that it was happening with enormous geographical horizons along the coasts of the Black Sea and the Mediterranean, from the, well, Ukraine to Spain, as it were, then you will begin to understand and realize the enormity and the intensity of the phenomenon. They all faced the issue of inclusion. Who would share, or in later terminology, who may be a citizen? And who would, uh, uh, and how would that sharing be expressed? The answer, more often than not, was a distribution of equal kleroi by lot in the form of special category of potoi kleroi, constituting the minimum possession of a new settler, but with no limit on personal wealth. So basically, at the moment of foundation, Greek colonists like the Spartan namesake, namesake were all homoioi, equal to each other. However, as at the Spartan colony of Paris, for example, and there are plenty of examples, social and economic differentiation would emerge very quickly within not the first, but usually in the second and third generation, which created another impetus for a colony to become a mother city in its own right and allow yet again conditions for equality and integration into a new social and political community made up of new homoioi, at least at the starting point. So, Aside from the personal kleros, the integration was probably effected through entering one of the philae. In some Hellenistic inscriptions, the method is explicit, klerosis, a lottery. Whereas the philae constitute by definition only a section of the polis, the cults of the polis implied sharing and participation of all community members. In colonies, the cultic framework was laid down by the Oikistes. He would have had supreme powers to do that. The Oikistes and the decree about the foundation of the Athenian colony to Bria indicates explicitly was autocrator with plenipotentiary powers, 
just like demonarchs and the supreme arbitrators we just mentioned, the Noetis tests would be responsible for, for implementing nomima. Now, Thucydides, book six, chapter three and four, uses the word tifemi for that constitutive action, laying down the nomima, thus emphasizing the imposition aspect of it. Those, uh, what are nomima? Those are the diacritics of a Greek community. But among such nomima, we may include the name and numbers of tribes, the terminology by which the institutions and magistrates are known, and most significantly, a common sacred calendar. Because the gods too were settlers who got the temene and share in the land. The sacred calendar of sacrifices not only binds the community together, but also keeps the covenants with the gods alive. A consistent set of nomima implies indeed an imposing hand since no Greek polis could exist with several conflicting sacred calendars. The nomima illustrate the links between mother cities and colonies. The nomima were mostly imported from the mother cities as the recent studies of Adrien Rovu eminently illustrates, but he's not the first to do that. His dossier is the richest. Achilochos in the mid seventh century had already complained that the misery of all the Greeks in, is converging on Tassos. That was a quote. And we noted how Apollo's second immigration oracle was addressed, Ace Helenas Pantas, to all the Greeks. Organized nuclear colonists could be joined by whoever wishes, Hobulomenos. The nomima, therefore, was an integrative force for the misery of all the Greeks a funnel or a riton to use a Greek image through which they were poured into the homogenizing cauldron of the Greek apoikia. Within one or two generations, everyone would become a Chalkidian or Megaria. However, when more waves of settlers arrived, or perhaps too many, when a critical mass might have shifted, integration failed. That's what happened in Sarini. And that's what Demonax wanted, it seems, to correct. So reformers, lawgivers, and founders of colonies all turned to Delphi. So Ikistes is our earliest example of the historical supreme arbitrator, unless we accept this diversity of like Kurdish. Greek tyrants too modeled themselves as supreme arbitrators and sometimes acted as city founders, often seeking the support of Delphi. And an article I had published in Metis in 1989 I claim that during the archaic period, Delphi prominence grew in tandem with it being the avant-garde of comprehensive reforms and new foundations. The early tyrants too were revolutionaries who modeled themselves on the figure of the Oikistes and often actually founding and refounding cities and like Hieron, craving the honors of the founder. However, when tyrants became unpopular, Delphi changed its tone and supported yet again the new forces, such as the Alcmaeonidae and the Athenian Claystone. What the tyrants were abusing was a consistent framework of a mindset and sets of practices around equality and equity. While tyrants might grab more land for themselves and their close followers, as they did, we never hear of an oikistes doing that. And we don't hear about it neither in historical, nor in quasi-historical, nor in legendary accounts. <clears throat> now, this is a major methodological point, I think, because what people do not bother to invent indicates that such notions lie outside their frame of reference. What is remarkable, in spite of the fact that quite a few personal names of founders have come down to us, we never hear of an Oikistes getting more land than others. What is even more significant is we never hear of the specific descendants of the posterity of founders as having any special status within their communities. Cyrene is the exception that proves the rule. The archaeological evidence seems to support this. At Megara Iblaya, the best documented 8th century colony was very beautifully uh, some, you know, equal plots of land on the ground where we can observe them. Uh, there's only one exceptional building, probably of the founder. I doubt he ever lived there because it did function as a hero, a hero shrine to the founder 
in the Agora, as was the nomos in the his elevation to the status of a hero only emphasized he's so far high up. It, it emphasizes the homoei aspect of everybody else. One major difference between an oikistes and demonax is that demonax is not named in the oracular response to the Cyrenius. The Mantineans are the ones to select her. Demonax is akin to the healer of Apollos sent by Delphi, as was the case with Epimenides, who came to free Athens of miasma. Thus, the authority of colonial Oikistai was based on their personal nomination, not by the mother city, but by Apollo, as was Bacchus I. Why was it a personal prophecy? I think because foundation oracles, namely those prophecies addressed to the founder by the city, and they're mostly in the second person singular, I think it is because the Oikistes embodied the transition from the potential to the actual. The mother city was not to own a colony, and the colony itself was not yet in existence. In religious terms, Apollo is the source of his authority, and when he comes to the city, either as a foreign arbitrator, as we see with Demonax, or to a city he has yet to establish, he stands in a distinct relation to a community with a status like no other. In short, people turn to Delphi and to Apollo as divine exegetes for social and political healing. When the Therians suffered a natural disaster and famine, a common motif in foundation story, Apollo's solution for Thera was to send the colony to Cyrene. When the Athenians suffered miasma, Apollo sent a healer. When the people of Cyrene suffered stasis, he sent the supreme political arbitrator. Colonization probably encouraged the articulation of political thinking, because instead of growing up into a given situation, now young persons detached from their elders needed to think out the police, penser la cité, a significant de degree of abstraction of the community, its layout on the ground, its institutions, its social organization and laws must have been achieved already with the early synoikismoi, with the early new foundations and the new comprehensive political and institutional reforms, at least dating to the mid seventh century and earlier. Specifically, let us not forget the close links between Sparta, its own colony Thera, believed to have been so, and its granddaughter colony Cyrene. Keeping that in mind, it will be interesting to compare the assignment of Demonax with the great retra at Sparta, also originating in Delphi. Quoting Theotaios, they heard the voice of Apollo and brought home from Pitho the oracles of the gods. Now, the retra dealt with what? Again, comprehensive ordinances for the Spartan regime, the founding of new temples, symbol of political unification probably, the division of the people into various units, regulating the council, the status of the kings, and the authority of the assembly. Structurally, most of those elements exist also in the comprehensive reforms of Demonax. The practice and the mindset of comprehensive reforms that function as supreme arbitrations, either directly by Apollo or through a nomination of an Oikistes or a lawgiver reformer, are therefore securely evidenced again to the mid seventh century. So to reach some conclusions, archaic Greek society knew contradictory forces that included on the one hand, numerous dividing lines according to localities and various corpora that potentially threatened to fragment the community, especially when combined with the rise of elites. The elites themselves, as Ian Morris suggests, were divided between middlers looking inside to the police and those looking at themselves, wishing to enhance their own position. Simplifying Morris here. But here we can observe the contradictory forces that apply not just to elite, but to the entire society. Everyone seems wanted to be a homo young, a homo young. To achieve that, Greeks kept settling overseas to create new conditions for equal sharing in the police. One man, one kleros, one citizen. However, 
those were not communistic kibbutzim, which used to exist in my country. And social and economic differentiation quickly followed. New wealthy elites emerged. And Megara is the best example where the, the primary conditions of Porto Clero were equal to the centimeter almost. Very quickly, you hear about the pachés, the fat ones at Megara Hiblaya, namely an elite. Uh, trying to rule the city, thus encouraging the establishment of yet new colonies with their clean state. Aside from colonization, there were calls for redistribution of land, a restart of society. I mentioned the demand for Gessen at the small in fourth century Sparta, but why go so late? We hear of such demands already in the poetry of Tirtaios in the mid seventh century. And Solon, if the fragment is genuine, it's not in the next something of the sixth century, it's proud to have declined demands for isomoiria. The recourse to a supreme arbitrator, especially an external one who comes and then disappears, and one who has the nomination of Pythian Apollo expresses compromise instead of violent stasis or revolution. In the case of Demonax, sorry, <clears throat> it also meant transferring power to the middle, to the demo. Now, both the Oikistes and the Katartister stand in the same relation as mediators and reconcilers under the auspices of Apollo. One significant difference is that traditions about lawgivers, such as Lycurgus and Solon, share the notion that the arbitrator must not be identified with the police by, because they leave, they die, etc. By contrast, the archaic Oikistes epitomized the new police. He was buried in the Agora and received annual heroic cult commemorating the very foundation of the police of which he was the focus. Finally, the ability to make collective decisions, such as to inquire adult about social and political ills, and then to invite an arbitrator and abide by his comprehensive reform, signifies the power of the overarching authority and sovereignty of the Greek police that succeeds in overriding internal divisions that threaten to fragment the political community in favor of personal or sectarian interests. The failure of Archesilaos to conduct a counter-revolution and implement another guess another smos merely in order to preserve his personal dynastic interest attests the rather successful cohesive power of the police and its citizens. Thank you, I'll finish it.